For those of you who don't know, Brian is a real pioneer in the blockchain space and uh, may well have created the first um, open marketplace for sale of goods and services on the internet uh, using Bitcoin. But um, why don't we talk a little bit about your background? You know, how did you build your chops? I know you worked at Booz and you work with the intelligence community in Fortune 500. How did that all turn into your fascination with Bitcoin and then eventually Open Bazaar? By the way, how many of you have heard of Open Bazaar? Okay, good. That's pretty good. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I mean, I picked up computers at a really early age and was always interested in building web applications and things like that. So I went to, you know, JMU right down the road uh, to do computer science. <laughs> yeah, go Dukes. Um, and uh, when I came out of college, you know, being in the D.C. area, it just made sense to go, working at, go work at a uh, government consulting firm. So I ended up at Booz Allen Hamilton. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, my, first, my first job wasn't really specifically any, anything related to, to Bitcoin technologies, but eventually I ended up getting into uh, encryption, uh, public key infrastructure, um, you know, networking, security certificates, smart cards, things like that around identity and, and cybersecurity. And, uh, and did that for, for the DOD, for the VA, for some classified agencies. And so being in that industry, uh, being very curious about encryption and, and how we exchange messages securely between people, uh, you know, Bitcoin came on the radar. And so uh, in 2013, I started running the Northern Virginia Bitcoin meetup. And uh, that was kind of the first, uh, you know, participation in the community and, and it kind of grew from there. So, yeah. so how did you find out about, um, well, you, how did you go from Bitcoin to, you went to a meetup in Toronto, I think, or you went to a meetup where you found out about this whole, the code that was the eventual uh, foundation for Open Bazaar, right? Yeah, so uh, for a long time I was trying to figure out a way to, to get more involved with building something on top of Bitcoin. And um, in April of 2014, there was a, uh, there was a conference in Toronto, uh, Bitcoin conference, and they had a hackathon as part of that event. And the winning entry for that uh, hackathon was called Dark Market. And Dark Market was built by... Um, kind of a notorious Bitcoiner by the name of Amir Taki and, uh, and also some, several folks who worked at Airbit's wallet, which is now Edge Wallet. But um, they got together and built Dark Market, which was the idea that, um, I mean, if you back up a couple months, I think Silk Road was shut down in October, I believe, of 2013. And so this was kind of on, of on, it was on everybody's mind because Silk Road was kind of pioneering the usage of Bitcoin, not just I can send it to my friends or put it in my wallet. It was actual commerce being done with, with Bitcoin. And I think it was a huge part of why Bitcoin became, uh, it started to get more mainstream notoriety. Now that it was gone, there was this vacuum, and I, and I think the idea behind this project was really, can we take existing technology and create a marketplace that's not run by Ross Ulbricht, it's actually run by the entire world, and, and it can't be shut down, sort of like BitTorrent. Um, and so that was the, the idea. So they spent 24 hours basically building that, and, uh, you know, I was not there. I saw this happen and, and wanted to participate in the project just from a technology standpoint. It seemed very interesting. Uh, but when I reached out to them, they were not interested in, in moving forward. And in fact, they had tr won the prize money in order to fund their other project, Dark Wallet. Um, and so th this was just like a, you know, it, it was just a, a short-term idea. It was not meant to be something that turned into a legitimate project. Right. So you seized upon it, right, like any other entrepreneur would do. Mm -hmm. And um, did you... You know, did you know what you wanted to do right away? You saw some potential here, right? So how did you go about saying, hey, I want to be the eBay of Bitcoin? Well, I mean, I, th I think um, I always was fascinated with the idea of the marketplace because Bitcoin, uh, you know, it's a cryptocurrency. You, you come to it, you start to say, well, what can I do with Bitcoin? Most people don't go, I'm really excited to do nothing with it and just hold it in my wallet. You know, I mean, now the price is going up and it's crazy. So there are a lot of like speculators. At the that time, what was Bitcoin worth? Um, I believe it was like around $100. And 
the transaction fees were like one or two cents. Oh. So, you know, the idea of using it as a currency, it basically was free to send. You know, it wasn't obscene to purchase it. The price wasn't like going that insane at the time. So it made a lot of sense. Um, and so this was the first, you know, actual decentralized app. I mean, I don't know if you can really name any other dApps. You know, that's kind of like a cliche term now, but like at the time there was no other decentralized app. It was like Coinbase and these other centralized uh, businesses that had made it user friendly for people to use it. But um, the only dApps were really wallets. So uh, it was super fascinating to, to start to begin working on that. And then when you start poking at it and you say, well, why is it limited to drugs? Why is it limited to guns? Like, why couldn't you use this for everything? Like, wouldn't everybody in the world want to use this? I mean, it, it seems to have a lot of advantages for Were you the anybody. first guy to think of this? I would have thought other people would have said, hey, I want to make a legitimate Silk Road. <laughs> You know, right? I mean, how, right? So how did well, you wind up getting to the front of the line here? Well, I mean, there's kind of a couple things at play. I mean, it takes a lot of work to build a marketplace. And most people find it very easy to just create it as a centralized application. And then they can just insert themselves in the middle and take a cut. And now they're making money. You know, it's easier to manage, all that. Instead, you blow up that whole model and you say, OK, let's make everything about that way more difficult. And let's do that. And let's not get paid. It's like, it's like the dumbest idea ever. But you know, this for us was more of a mission of like trying to accomplish a goal, not really like, okay, we're gonna start a business. I mean, Open Bazaar didn't start as a company. It started as an open source project with volunteers. And you know, it's, were other people thinking of this? Yeah, a lot of people were. That's why we got like hundreds and hundreds of volunteers like immediately when we started the project that came in with all these like really clever ideas. Like how about a contracting system? How about an arbitration system? How about, you know, all these things came in because people were thinking about little components of the marketplace, but they just didn't have the idea of like how it all came together. All right, so for those of you that don't know what Open Bazaar is, you can basically download the app on your computer and get to work as a buyer or a seller, right? In a in a peer-to-peer -peer type uh, platform where, um, now there is some limitations on privacy, right? Which I wanna talk about, but how are you different from say eBay um, or Amazon? Uh, in a bunch of different ways, actually. Okay. Um, well, one, we don't take PayPal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, you don't take anything but Bitcoin right now, right? Right now we have three supported currencies, okay. Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Zcash. Um, and we're hoping to add more in the future. But uh, you know, originally it was always just Bitcoin. And, and for the foreseeable future, we're gonna remain cryptocurrency focused. Um, so how are we different? Um, first of all, there's no eBay.com that you can go to right now. The, the network is completely run by people who run the desktop application. So if you go to openbazaar.org and you download the app and you start it up, you connect to the network and that's it. That's the store. So if you want to sell something and you create a listing to sell that something, it sits on your computer. And if your computer were to get destroyed or go off the internet, it would kind of disappear. So you could see, you could see how this becomes a much more resilient uh, commerce platform because you know if you're selling something that somebody doesn't agree with like there's no one to take you off right like you just you they'd have to come find your computer and get rid of you which in my opinion and is anybody kind of, can sell anything or any service on open bazaar correct yes so it actually it kind of makes it like much more reasonable for the for an international audience because if you have an entity like ebay who is who is regulating this marketplace, right? Like they're in control of like what's good, what's not good, what can happen. They have to understand all of these different jurisdictions internationally, like, and they have to be able to do that. And so they opt to be extremely conservative and, and just kind of, you know, they could take away your business for no good reason. There were there was a time when mining equipment was like considered, you know, something questionable. And so people were having their entire mining hardware businesses ripped off of eBay, and it was like, this is not illegal. Like, why are you doing this? Well, because we can and we feel like we need to. Whereas this is more like running your own website. Like it's up to you. If you're gonna do something illegal, you're the one that's responsible for that content. Like they're gonna come and find you and shut you down. They're not gonna shut Open Bazaar down because Open Bazaar is ultimately not responsible for that. It's just a protocol. It's just an agreement between a bunch of people worldwide to conduct commerce together. 
if one person's a bad actor, shouldn't mean the whole marketplace gets shut down, which is, you know, kind of how Silk Road ended up getting shut down, right? Like, there were people that were selling legitimate things on her. Yes, it was a minority of the marketplace, but if I was selling in PDF and I had a legitimate business and it had scaled to millions or billions of users and they shut the whole thing down because one bad actor, right. you'd be like screaming foul. So it's, in a lot of ways, the Silk Road case is, is, a, is a matter of perception because the marketplace was overwhelmingly illicit. And what about privacy? Um, you know, if I'm buying something on Amazon, not only do they know who I am, but they know my whole history and they send me recommendations and sometimes I like that, sometimes I don't. Um, if I were going to be a buyer on Open Bazaar, how do I protect my anonymity if I want to? So um, I think, you know, w within a marketplace, I mean, one of the biggest issues is, is reputation and trust, right, and fraud. So how do you, you know, you have to have this balance between like complete anonymity where you know nothing about the party you're transacting with and then this idea that you know of this business and you know that there are some kind of legal repercussions if there, something falls through in your transaction. Now at the core level, we have Bitcoin, which is meant to be a trustless payment methodology. And then we also have something in our system called escrow, which is essentially using Bitcoin scripting language in order to create like a smart contract between the buyer and the seller and potentially an arbitrator and that protects these funds. So I don't just give you Bitcoin and hope you deliver a good or a service. I actually deliver that money into an escrow account. Once you deliver that product or service to me, then I can release that money out of the escrow with you as a team so that you get paid. And if there's a problem, then somebody can help move those funds as a refund or like, you know, you could split the difference or whatever you want to do. But see, that, that, is, uh, that, that helps create some level of trust, but then how do you know that all the parties in the transaction are operating, you know, faithfully? Now you're starting to talk about being able to understand who these people are. So what we've done is we've adopted a model where it's like security is, privacy is more of an opt-in thing. So it, by default, you may be more of a public entity, like your computer's not hidden from the network, but you can run the software behind Tor. So all you have to do is run your Tor browser, you, you fire up OpenBazaar and it will say, hey, you're on Tor, do you wanna be private on OpenBazaar as well? And you're completely hidden from the network. And what so, percent of your users are hidden? Probably five to 10% or so. So pretty low percentage. It's a low percentage because once again, it's opt-in and it, uh, is t you know, you have to have the Tor browser. You, it is also slower mm -hmm. because of the security layer that's in there. Um, and so people choose to, you know, they don't care that much about it, so they'll just opt to not do it. But it should be higher. I mean, in my opinion, it should be higher. People should care more about privacy. But see, this is also the balance for a decentralized application where you want mainstream usage, so you don't want to encumber new users with like this overwhelming architecture they have to install on their computer. <laughs> like yeah. it should just be as easy as visiting a website. You touched on buyer protection. So you have this arbitration system. You, what do you call them? Moderators. Uh, moderators. So you have a sort of a kind of a manual process, right? Where a moderator would get involved and arbitrate if there's a dispute between a buyer and a seller. You're sort of like eBay's customer service. They have a customer service department for dispute resolution. How's that all working out? And how do you, as a buyer, because if I'm buying something on Amazon, I have a confidence. If I'm buying something with credit card, I have a confidence that I'm protected. How do you sort of use the, how does a moderator give me a, a buyer confidence that I'll be protected if I get screwed by the seller? Yeah, so this is, this is one of those things that's evolving over time, but um, so moderators, anybody can be a moderator. I mean, any of you guys can be a moderator if you wanted to be, um, you just set your account as a moderator and then people can choose you to, be a part of the tr transaction, um, and you can set terms and you know terms and services, uh, you know, for like what you provide. Like I'll I won't conduct you know arbitration for illegal goods or whatever. You can have your own policies or whatever. But people would but choose. There you. are moderators for illegal goods. I mean I, I don't know because oh, okay. it's private. You wouldn't know. right. Like I mean we like you would assume maybe. I, I would have, I would assume yeah, right. Like yeah. I mean that's. It can be used for anything, right? So, um, you know, and that's another big question that people ask is like, well, how much volume is going through here is illegal? And it's like, well, 
You have we no don't, idea. We don't know because these pr transactions are private. It's just like Craigslist, you know. Um, and but back to the to the moderator piece. I mean, yeah, that's true. Like, if anybody can be a moderator, how can you trust that person? Um, so we did see, like, a couple months ago, we started to see like people get savvy about this, and they would like kind of team up with a merchant, and then they would like refund themselves or something like that. Like they would collude. And so then you have to start thinking like, well, how do we give them reputation? How do we vet them? How do we do this? Um, at my company, OB1, we've opted to start vetting certain moderators. So we have like a policy, set of policies that we require them to be communicative. They have to have certain profiles. They have to be, you know, we have to know some things about their identity. And then we've, we kind of vet them as like trusted moderators, but like it's still, I mean, it's just uh, an extra signal to say, this guy is probably legitimate. And so we have like a handful. eBay at the very early days with the feedback, there, that was a yeah. big thing, right? Yeah. You wanted, I wouldn't buy from anyone who didn't have at least, you know, 100 feedbacks, positive feedbacks. Mm -hmm. So that's your way of doing it. But you mentioned OB1. I want to talk about your company. So um, you got involved in Open Bazaar. You built this beautiful platform. And then I guess somehow you decided, hey, I got to make money on this thing, right? <laughs> So you created this company, OB1. Uh, what does OB1 do? And uh, talk a little bit about your, um, your initial vision and then how you got money from two of the biggest VCs in the country, Union Square and Andreessen Horowitz. Yeah, um, so we didn't really aim to start a company. It kind of just happened. Um, through, so throughout 2014, we started getting hundreds of volunteers on the project that became like this huge thing. I mean, uh, several of us were working like full-time jobs, coming home in the evening, having dinner and going right back to work until three in the morning every night. And it just was like completely untenable. And then after a while we we're like, this is, might have some legs, like maybe we should do this like full-time. So we looked around and we we're like, maybe we should start a token. Oh no, that actually didn't exist. <laughs> no. We looked around and we said, oh, maybe we could do a Kickstarter and get like 20K and we could just start a whole thing. We're like, ah, 20K is a lot, we probably can't raise that. I think the largest one was like 20K at the time. Uh, Dark Wallet actually had raised like 20K and that was the most anybody had gotten. It was crazy. So uh, that kind of idea was out. And we had received a bunch of donations. In fact, to this day, we've, re we've raised over $100,000 in just vol like volunteer donations to the project that we haven't spent either. <laughs> um, this is for OB1? For, this is for Open Bazaar. Oh, Open Bazaar. Uh, so we were going to try and fund the project uh, that way, but that still seemed kind of light. Um, so the other option would be VC. So we're like, would VCs be interested? And I had read an article by Joel Monegro, who runs Placeholder Capital now, um, and he was at Union Square Ventures as an, as an associate. He'd written this article about how Silk Road was pioneering all these technologies and that maybe this would kind of come in and start disrupting their current investments at Union Square Ventures, like, uh, um, you know, perhaps Etsy, and I think they had, they had some other investments that were marketplaces. And, you know, I, I, it would, I mean, it just like was perfectly married up with what we were doing. So I contacted them and I was like, hey, this is a really fascinating article. Have you heard of us? And they were like, yeah, we wrote the article basically about you. Like, you've been on our radar forever. Cool. And, and they were like, why don't, you why don't we have a call? And I was like, all right, fine. Maybe I can get some mentorship advice or whatever, right? <laughs> and we had this long conversation and it was super fascinating. And at the end of it, the Union Square was like, this is insane, we could never fund this, but uh, we could let, let some of our friends know, you know, which is like the kiss of death in, in the entrepreneurial world. Like, like these, like, she's not beautiful enough to date, but like, maybe my friend will date you. Like, you know, it's like, who's gonna want that? Like, it's like the worst referral ever. So, um, you know, I was like, okay, that's over. But like, 2 a.m. that night, he called me, like he called me and, Joel was like, you need to come to New York like right now. We've changed our mind. Like this is definitely something we're interested in. And so like he was like, don't do a pitch deck, don't do anything, just come here now for a conversation. So we like literally rode the train up to New York. We flew another guy <laughs> from Mountain View over and like went to New York City and met with them and they were just like super excited. And you know, it took a couple weeks to get the deal done, but then like right as we were about to like close the deal, um they, uh, Union Square called, Fred Wilson called me and he's like, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen and Chris Dixon want in, like, can they come Amazing. in the deal? And we're like, <laughs> yes, sure. 
Yes, right. very much so. And we were like, should we go to California and meet with them? And they're like, no, no, you don't need to. They're like, they're cool. Let's, let's just do it. And wow. so we were like, all right. This was fine. for the original A round. Was yeah, a so million we raised a million in, in our yeah. seed round with them, our first seed. Right. And, How um, helpful have Fred and Mark been? Have you, you talked to them on a regular basis? Um, I've I've only spoken with Mark briefly because we work with Chris Dixon over there. Um, and Fred, I've I talk to frequently, but um, our partner there is Brad Burnham, so we mostly work with Brad. But um, but they're they're super helpful. I mean. It's, it's incredible to be able to have conversations with them. Um, and they, they're very challenging as well. Like Mark Andreessen, I mean, the first thing he asked me was like, well, why don't you accept credit cards? <laughs> and you're like, well, this whole thing is built on cryptocurrency. You know, like, and you can't tell like, if it's like, is he being serious or is he trying to like, challenge your convictions about what you're doing? And you know, that's a lot of what you're doing is you, you know, the investors want to know that like, you're actually not just a very wishy-washy on your idea, like you're, you're convicted, you're, you're committed to doing what you said you're gonna do. So. so when they gave you the million, how refined was your sort of business model or did you not have one? We had none, absolutely No business none. model. I mean, we sat, I remember I was sitting in Union Square's office and they were like, well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna start, we were like, well, we always have to start a company and they're like, well, what are you gonna do? And we're like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. And they're like, okay, all right, fine. Here's a million because, bucks. Because they the idea was that. Big. They knew it was massive. They said, they probably thought somewhere, somehow, you guys are smart guys, you'll figure out a way to make money. At yeah, some point. I mean, their opinion was like, look, you know, we invest in companies that screw up all our other companies. Like, that's how you, that's how, you know, new projects come along and eat old projects. So instead of pouring money, more money into these incumbents that they know are going to get disrupted at some point, they're looking for the future. And this, for them, they, they looked and said, there's nothing else in the marketplace. We believe in blockchain. We believe in commerce and, and this idea of, you know, the marketplace, so this is where our investment should be. Right. So what does OB1 do? So OB1, at the moment, I mean, the majority of our work is, built, is building Open Bazaar, um, but we're starting to shift into a new um, kind of era. So our plans for the future is to basically split uh, the organization into a nonprofit foundation for Open Bazaar, which would be like coordinating the, the free software, the protocol, the network, and then OB1 could remain solely focused on being a, a business, a true business, and, and earning revenue, since that's kind of the idea. Um, and how are you gonna earn, what kind of revenue are you gonna earn? Well, so, so right now we run a couple different services. Um, one, we're building a mobile, mobile app that's basically like a plus version of the Open Bazaar network. It runs on uh, Android and iOS that we're hoping to release soon. Um, it has our search engine in it. The other service is the actual search engine. So we, uh, we build a search engine that's kind of like Google for the internet. It crawls Open Bazaar, looks for listings, and then you know, we, can, we can curate that and provide promoted listings and things like that. So there'll be like search revenue like that way. Um, and then the, the ultimate option, we which- started, We talked earlier, he founded a business, Open Bazaar, that was based on decentralization, but then you got VC money, went to the dark side, and now you're centralizing <laughs> search results. But to be fair, like, we don't have any offices, so right. we're okay. located all around the world, <laughs> which is true. I mean, we Victor's have people. Victor's got lots of space in Arlington, if you yeah. want. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have, people, right. we have people in Australia and all throughout the, the country, and we pay people in Bitcoin if mm -hmm. they want, so it's... It's a pretty, I mean, we're, we're dog fooding everything here to some, to some level. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, there's like a lot of like tension in it as an organization when you are building something that's decentralized and open source and shouldn't be controlled by anybody, but yet you're a company. Like that's definitely something that we, we, we talk about and kind of like wrestle with all the time. Yeah. That's why we want to split this into the nonprofit foundation where their responsibilities are not to generate profit for their shareholders, right? Like they're, they're servicing the community and then Obi-Wan can focus on that. Right, and then you raised a, an additional round. Recently. Well, I mean, we've raised a couple rounds. So right. like we raised a million and see, in our first seed, we raised uh, three, three million again um, as like a second seed. Then we raised like a 250K note uh, from Digital uh, Currency Group. And then we just closed recently our Series A, which was five million um, with all of them, and we brought in Omer's Ventures, which is uh, the investment arm of Omer's, which is like Canada's largest pension fund. They f they funded Shopify and some others, so yeah. Yeah, and um, 
talk about, you're, you see so you're toying with the idea or maybe you're gonna roll out a token. So what is the token? Is it a utility token? Is it a security token? What's the purpose of it? And how's it gonna play in your ecosystem? Well, so, so I mean, I think I'm a very strong advocate that like a token shouldn't just be created for the sake of creating a token, right? Like there's tons of projects out there, there's tons of businesses that are like, oh, let's just create a token and we'll raise a billion dollars and like everything will be awesome. But like they don't even think about the economics of the token or like why are we creating a token? So for Open Bazaar, I mean, we've been around for years and the software has been operating like there's no like there's no missing component that we need to solve with the token. So we, we're asking ourselves like, well, what what could be what could a token be used for? And I think that there's a very valuable proposition around uh, like basically think of uh, Google AdSense for like a, a decentralized app. I mean, there's really no way to like promote good content on a decentralized platform. So like one of our biggest issues with Open Bazaar is like people log onto the network, they see just a bunch of random stuff because there's no one there curating it, there's no one culling through all the stuff, like weeding out the bad stuff, promoting good stuff. There's no way for like vendors to say, hey, I have this great new movie coming out, like I want to promote it right here on you know this keyword or whatever. And so that's the scenario we want to explore with the token. So we'll, we're going to create like an auction-based ad platform service on top of Open Bazaar. So if I search for bicycles, you know, I can bid on that space and like boost my products or services or whatever I want to that keyword. And that way, and through using the token, it won't be just OB1 that benefits from that. It'll be anybody who's a token holder. So basically the way it will work, and we're gonna be releasing a white paper soon, is like it pays like almost like a dividend back to people who hold the token. So if you hold the ad tokens, all that, like a portion of the ad revenue goes to like the entire community. So we're trying to like basically create a decentralized Google AdSense on top of it. How are you getting the tokens into the market? Are you gonna do a coin offering? Um, that's still up for debate. I mean, we're actually really tossing around the idea of just doing an airdrop where, you know, because one of our fundamental uh, hopes is that like we want the users to get it, like not just investors. Right. So like if we were to do something like a SAFT, you know, that would be accredited investors, and then like, what are they gonna do with it? They're just gonna speculate with it yeah. or hold it, and it doesn't get into the hands of the people that we want to help drive this ad network, this you know, curation marketplace, so. Are the um, tokens gonna have sort of market value, though? Are they gonna trade on an exchange, or are they gonna have not intrinsic value, but you know, economic value of some kind? I mean, I don't know if you can stop it from being traded, but um, you know, I, like I said, I think we, you know, we may do something like an airdrop and just let the market price it mm -hmm. and not just say, hey, it's worth this and, and sell it. Um, which I, I think, you know, I mean, there's pros and cons to that approach. Um, and we're still weighing those out. But it's certainly one that's super appealing to us because the goal is to, like, you know, get the, the marketplace moving. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would stimulate, I think, because you're allowing sort of like Google AdWords, right, instead of paying for cash. If you're a merchant and you want to, you know, boost results, right? They would pay you in your token. I yeah, guess. and one other aspect of it that I think will be really interesting for just about anybody, not just merchants, is that um, we're going to be giving people the ability to create custom feeds of data. So it, that sounds technical, but basically, imagine it like a Pinterest board. Like you're finding cool things. Like let's say you find really cool cars, and you've got it on your your page. And then you're able to actually market that page. If you're driving traffic to those listings and to those merchants, then they can pay for advertising on that space and you can earn those tokens and it kind of creates this circular economy for, for people. So I, I think that there will be lots of opportunities for people to in, earn revenue that are not just selling and buying goods and services. They, it'll, be, it'll start to look more like almost like an affiliate network. Mm -hmm. So I know we're gonna have some time for some questions. Um, before we get there, I just want to ask you about your the currencies that you're taking. Are you going to be taking more than the three currencies? Um, it would seem like the more currency you take, the more action you're going to get, or are you just going to focus on three for now? Well, I mean, we have our wallet built into the app, so I think that's been the difficult part of it, is like maintaining a bunch of different wallets is really hard. Um, but we're building something 
uh, it's called a multi-wallet and it will support a bunch of different coins and we're going to allow people to build plugins. So if you have like some Bob coin that you want to get into Open Bazaar, you can build a plugin and everybody who installs that plugin for Bob coin will be able to accept or, or pay with Bob coin. And so that's how we're going to approach that. And so once that happens, you know, we'll be able to open it up to just about any coin uh, imaginable. So that's, that's the future plan. Yeah. Cool. Uh, one last question. What's your prediction for Bitcoin for this year? <laughs> I almost wore my $10,000 sweatshirt today because it's almost up there. Right. But um, I, I don't know. I think, I think it has the potential to have another run up. But, you know, I would say maybe 20,000 is probably the cap. And, but, you know, I have to keep in mind, like, I, I remember for 485 days or something, it was like down in like the $300 range and nobody thought it would ever get out of there. <laughs> and then it shot up to, you know, 20,000. So, you know, we could be in for a long drought. I, I don't know. But I think uh, what's going to stimulate that is like the innovation and growth around dApps, around tokens, around all these things that are happening right now. And that looks really exciting. It looks really promising. We're starting to see the fruits of these early ICOs. They're starting to deliver products. Whether or not people use them or that's going to really be the, the pivotal moment. Like if we find, like if, if a CryptoKitties that's like 100 times larger is successful this year, who knows where we could go. Right. Great. We do have some time for some questions. So um, yes, sir. If you pay your employees in Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is so volatile, how do you determine what they get? So the, the simple answer is that we use a third party service called Bitwage and they handle that. Um, but, but no, I mean, uh, so the way that, I mean, it generally works is that like, you know, you just pay market rate and then the, the, the accept, you know, the, the employee will have to deal with the volatility, which can go either way. Um, in fact, we had one person who accepted payment in Bitcoin and he couldn't figure out how to get it out of Bitwage. And then like a year later, it, it like <laughs> he paid off his college tuition because he, Forgot it was in there and it had gone up. So it can work both ways, though. It's based on a fiat currency, is how you determine how much you actually pay them. Yeah, so with Bitwage, what you can do is you can either accept Bitcoin straight or you can say, I want it in my euros or, or dollars or whatever. So you would just, they would just transfer it for you into your bank account if, so to, if you wanted it. Yes, in the middle. Hi, I'm Brian. How do you promote uh, your followers to join the cause uh, of the Open Bazaar? Was it this open source deception? How do you do that? That's a, that's a really difficult one, especially because it's, I think today is very different than when we were starting. Um, in fact, if you go to the, the first week that I, I tried to solicit uh, participation on Reddit, I mean, the Reddit thread is still there. I was like, hey, does anybody want to help me do work on Open Bazaar? And I think the first comment was like, fuck you. <laughs> so it didn't start out well, um, and it's still there. You know, it, it, it's tough, but I think if you're creating something that's useful, like people, developers tend to be interested in exploring new things, and they start to come, and, and you can foster a good relationship with those, those key contributors and you start to build from there. Um, now is a lot, difficult, a lot more difficult because if I wanted to create a commerce marketplace like what we're doing, um, and this has happened to me many times at conferences now, is like what's the incentive for them to help me do it and not get paid as opposed to start a new token and raise 50 million and go start their own project and duplicate exactly what I'm doing? Because there's that demand right now. So I think there's a lot of competition and, and we see, we have that problem too, is like recruiting people to work with us when they could do something else. But like people come up all the time, they're like, hey, I'm doing exactly what you're doing and, and we're gonna do a token. And it's like, well, why don't you come work with us? Like, well, I'm raising a token. You know, it's like, right. so I, the landscape is much different now. Yes. Yes. Andrew. Yeah. I'll just be curious to hear, um, like with, with USB, were you ever given an insight into the, the conversations that went on between that, like those two calls that you got? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously they're probably keeping some stuff secret, but like they're very transparent about what their investment thesis is and like their thinking. Um, I ask them all the time. Uh, they express their opinions too. I mean, for instance, Union Square Ventures is 
very sold on the idea of doing tokens and how that is going to fundamentally stimulate these communities and stuff. And we've disagreed for a long time that that was like totally requisite to be successful. Like Open Bazaar works and it doesn't have a token. Like so, you know, we have this back and forth and they explain to us what their thinking process is and like they give us recommendations, but like ultimately they're just mentors, right? Like we can choose advice or not choose advice. You can understand why they're doing something or not. But um, understanding their like what they're looking for is very challenging. I would just say like, you know, you're reading a lot about what they're writing about. You know, what do they think, you know, they have blogs, for instance, so, you know, it's very easy to understand what, like what, what's on Fred Wilson's mind at any given time because he writes about it and that's how we've figured it out. Yes. Do you have an apartment in Mountain View? <laughs> no, I actually work in my house in Fairfax. So, um, you guys talk to the guys with Acumen Technologies? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes. Are you, are you concerned a little bit about the Silk Road precedent? I think the argument that you said about we're open, anyone can do whatever they do that's on them, not on us. I heard that same argument from Russ Ulbricht's mom at a conference, and that, that was his thesis as well. I'm just providing a platform, what they do, they do. How do you protect yourself from? Well, first of all, I completely disagree with her on that premise because he was clearly, <laughs> I mean, he, he, he ran the marketplace, he owned the property, he had the data, he had the control, and he chose not to do anything about that, right? So that's a completely different scenario. Second, he was profiting from it handsomely, <laughs> whether he spent it or not. So, you know, that right there, you're already part of the crime, right? Like, I mean, you're profiting, you're hurting other people potentially. So, like, you know, in, in the case of a protocol, an open source protocol, that no one is participating in other than developers, that's a free speech issue at that point. Um, now, OB1 is a company and we run a search engine and we crawl the network and we provide those listings to people to view. So it is, the onus is on us to like filter that stuff from that perspective. So we do that and we follow US law, but that doesn't mean that someone else could just set up one anonymously and crawl everything and just expose everything. So, it, you know, that's, that's where the delineation is, is between those things. And I think separating this into a foundation, a nonprofit foundation and an, a, a for-profit entity, I think will make much more sense there because the lines won't be as blurred, like what, what, who's profiting here on what piece. But yeah, I mean, if we're worried, yeah, I'm always worried. I mean, I've had conversations with the FBI before. They, they want to understand what's going on with it. I mean, that's realistic, so. We got time for one more. Yes. Um, I want to ask, uh, how do you guys get around the legal aspect of Open Bazaar? Like, um, one of the defects Mega, when Mega uploaded was upload was closed, was that they didn't control what users uploaded to the website. Um, so I guess is that the same with the services that's provided on Open Bazaar? Yeah. So it's it's very similar to like a BitTorrent for instance. I mean, if you're sharing a movie on BitTorrent, you're not putting that movie somewhere, right? It's on your computer and then you're sharing access to your computer, which you control. And in this case, you're setting up a store on your computer or your mobile phone and you're providing access to that. So you control that data. So there's no like, there's no like, we are not a custodian of your data. So we provide a, a viewer, a browser for that information, but that information does not reside within our corporate environment. If the FBI called you and said, hey, I want all your, you know, data, um, you wouldn't have much to give them, right? That's exactly what they asked. I mean, you funny. Don't, that's the you first don't... question they asked us. They were like, if we were to subpoena you, what could you provide us? And what would the answer be? And the, an and the answer is not a lot. I mean, whatever is publicly available, because the only data that we have is the data that you have. I mean, we can see what listing, what's for sale, we can see what the prices are, we can see, you know, if somebody uses a public IP, maybe we have something in our logs, but that's it. And so. if the FBI set up a bunch of nodes to, um, to chase people that are selling illegal things, you can't control that either, right? And you wouldn't even know about it probably, right? I mean, I think, so, I mean, the, the biggest thing would be that like they see something that's, like they see someone being trafficked on there and then they want to know more about that. And we could give them data that we've seen if they like made a mistake and they expose themselves somehow, we could share that data. But like we don't have, like they don't sign up for an account with us. They don't, 
we don't hold their funds, we don't transact with them. I mean, there's really nothing, there's no interaction between us and any person doing any kind of illegal activity. So, you know, I think we're looking at ways in the future of kind of self-reporting certain things, like our search engine filters things, and we may provide that kind of data to them so that they understand it if they need it or, or request it. But like, I mean, there's really not much we can provide, so. Well, thank you so much. Well, uh, Brian, thank you for sharing your morning with us. We really appreciate it. Um, hopefully you can stick around. We have a full day. I'm sure a lot of people want to talk to you, but it's time to bring up our awesome panel. But before we do that, let's give it up for Brian. Can I, uh, can I, um, yeah. can I also promote, um, if, if, you guys, if you guys haven't used it before, go to openbazaar.org. And um, we're also working on a web interface, so if, you're, if you don't want to download it and you just want to see what's available, you can go to ob1.trade and you can check out the network uh, and see what's on there right now. Do you have any special discount codes for anything? Any, uh, I, personally away don't. anything? I personally don't, <laughs> but uh, you know, right. feel free to message me on Twitter or uh, wherever and maybe, maybe we can do something. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Let's give it up. Thank you.